Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back. Now for this tutorial, I would like to cover the various different ways that we can handle flow control in our Java programs. And we've seen a few of these things before, namely the if else statements and the while loops, and we briefly touched upon the for loop when we discussed arrays. Now I just want to take a step back and go over all of these so that you're aware of the different options available to you and you can begin making decisions about which ones will best fit your needs to solve a given problem. What you're going to find is there's actually some degree of overlapping and you can pretty much get the same results with one or more of these. At that point you need to make a decision as to which one you want to apply to your code. Sometimes this decision may actually be based around what you think is going to be more adaptable and scale better in the future. So if you anticipate that you may need to add code later on, it may make sense to make one choice over another. In other situations, it may come down to efficiency. So if one option is going to consume less memory or perform a little faster, for example, it would make sense to choose that over a different option that might take up more memory or perform a little bit slower. Most of the time, however, your decision is going to come down purely uh, to your style and what you're most comfortable with because ultimately you want your code to be very maintainable and readable to you so that you understand what's going on at a quick glance. A lot of the times this means the less lines of code, the better. That's not always the case because technically we could write an entire Java program on a single line, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to read or easy to understand. It's actually really difficult in that situation. So you don't want to take it to such an extreme that you're actually doing more harm than good. But if you only have four lines of code to go through as opposed to 20, if an error pops up, now you only need to look through four lines of code to figure out where that error is. So usually less lines of code is a goal that you should look to reach. So we'll use each of these in examples to specifically show the similarities and the differences between them. And hopefully you'll get a little bit more comfortable with each one of these. So quickly I'll go through these and we've seen the if else statements before, so I don't really need to spend time doing it, but essentially you have an if statement and we evaluate some condition. If it's true, we're going to execute the series of statements within its block or within its scope. And if the condition is false, we would jump down to the else block and execute whatever statements fall within its scope. Now, similarly, we can actually replace the if else statements in a lot of cases with what's known as a switch statement. And a switch statement relies on a series of cases to evaluate different sections of code. So what we mean by that, let's say we have an integer variable called x, and we're initializing it to a value of 2 in this case. We're going to pass our variable that we want to analyze into our switch case, uh, our switch statement rather. And then we're going to make a case for each of the potential options that we think we want to handle for that variable. So for case 1, and this 1 is an integer because x is an integer, so we're anticipating handling different integer values. So in the case that x is 1, we're going to execute this statement. So we just print out 1. And then notice this break statement right here. This is a special keyword. And basically what it's doing is, is telling us once we execute this, when we see the break statement, to jump down to the closing bracket. In the situation that our x is equal to 2, which it is in this case, we're going to evaluate this section of code. So we would print out 2 and then break. And if our x was some other value, 0, 3, 5, 9, anything else other than whatever we've handled specifically with our cases, we're going to execute the default segment of code. In this case, we would print out nothing to see here and then break out. If we actually left out the break statements, we would just continue executing each of these instructions in order. And it wouldn't matter which case we're evaluating. And we'll see this a little more in our um, examples. So we have the for loop. And we've seen this again with the use of arrays and one 
use for it is actually iterating through arrays, but we'll see another way to use the for loop a little later. Basically, the for loop is a way of continually doing a loop of code or a set of instructions a given number of times. So in some ways, this is similar to the while loop, and we could make it act essentially the same way. It comes in three parts. The first part is executed when we first initialize it. So we're going to set an integer i equal to 0. And now each time that we pass through this loop, we're going to evaluate the middle section here. So as long as i is less than 10, we're going to continue executing the instruction or series of instructions that fall in its scope. And at the end of this loop, each time we want to increase our i by 1, so i++. plus plus doesn't have to be i++. You'll see this a lot, but it could be i++5, for example. It just depends on whatever you need out of this loop. So for this case, our i is 0 to start with. 0 is less than 10, so we're going to print out whatever i is, in this case 0. Now we get here, we increase by 1. So 1 is less than 10. We're going to print out 1 increase by 1, so now i is 2. 2 is less than 10, so we're going to execute. We're going to print 2, add 1, so now it's 3. 3 is less than 10, so we print out 3. And we keep doing this. We get 9 is less than 10, so we print it out, and now we add 1. 10 is not less than 10, so this is false. And we don't actually continue executing. We just jump down here and follow through with whatever instructions follow. The while loop, and again, we've used this a few times now, so it should be a little bit familiar, but you have the while loop, and you have a condition in here. And what we're saying is while this condition is true, execute these statements that fall within this scope. So the risk here is that in this situation we have true. If we never change the parameters of this, so as long as this is always true, these statements are always going to execute, and we can get stuck in an infinite loop continually. We can also have a situation where this never actually runs. So if this was always false, these statements would never actually be executed. We also have something called the do while loop. And the do while loop has our do keyword, and then in its scope, we would have a series of instructions. And then we would follow with the while afterwards to evaluate some condition. The difference between these is that the do while loop will always run at least once. So we're always going to do these series of statements or instructions at least one time. Then we get down here and check if we want to continue doing it. Now, I've also put in red here this keyword continue. And we'll go over this in our examples, but continue is somewhat um, similar to the way break operates. And again, we'll see that in an example later on. So then we have our enhanced for loop. And this is a very useful way to iterate through an array. So let's open up with an integer array. We're calling it values. And we're storing into it explicitly these integers right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now, if you remember from our, our discussion on arrays, we start with a 0 index. So we have 0 index is where 1 occurs. That occurs at position 0. 2 occurs at position 1. Sorry about that. 3 occurs at position 2. 4 occurs at position 3. And we get to the end, 8 occurs at position 7. So one way we could actually go through this is using our traditional for loop, where we would say integer i is equal to 0. As long as i is less than the length of our array, the length, again, is 8 values. So we would be saying as long as our i is one way of thinking about it is one less than the length of it, we're going to print out whatever value occurs at that position in the array. We'll see this in some examples later on, so don't get too confused by it. 
what we can do with the enhanced for loop is rather than writing out all of that code, we can say for, and we'll give an integer, a single integer called v, and we're going to pass into it each value from our array one at a time and print it out. So for each value in values, print it out. And here this zero is incorrect. We actually only have starting with one. So we're going to take the first value in values and store it into v and print it out, which is one. And now we want to take the next value and store it into v and print it out. And then we want to take the next one, which is three, print it out. So we keep doing that until eight. Eight gets stored into v, we print it out. And there's no more values in here. So we actually just continue with the rest of the code that might fall after this closing bracket. And then finally, we have this ternary operation. Now, ternary references three. And what we see is there's three sections to this ternary operation. What we want is, and we can ignore this integer x equals zero for a minute, but let's say we have an integer z and we want to store into it some integer value, of course. In this case, we're going to be putting either three or five into it. Well, that depends on the condition, and the condition is going to be either true or false. So we've set a Boolean called flag, and we've named it, uh, initialized it to true in this case. So we're going to evaluate our condition. If it's true, so the question mark says that we're using a ternary operator. Evaluate this. If it's true, we're going to use whatever is in this true section, which I labeled in green. And if it's false, then we jump to the false section, which is in red here, and we separate the two with a colon. So in this case, since our flag is true, we're going to take three and store it into our integer z. If this were false, we would jump to the false, which is five, and store five into our integer z. Now what we'll see later on is that we don't have to explicitly put numbers here. We can actually put a method reference here. So we can have a method here and a method here. Both of these methods would return an integer value, which would get stored in z. And Again, this doesn't have to be a Boolean. It could be a comparison. Is some value less than some other value? If that's true, run a method. If it's false, run some other method and return the results into our variable assignment here. So that concludes the PowerPoint. And now we'll actually see some of this actually play out in our real code. So let me go ahead and just close this. No. I'll delete this and we'll start from scratch again. So once you open up Eclipse, go ahead and create a new Java project. And I'll just name this flow control. And now I'm going to make a separate class file for each of the, I guess you could say, sub sections for this. This way you can easily reference this later on if you need to look back. So the first one we're going to go over is the if else statements. So I'll just name this file if capital I else capital E dot Java. And we'll just say use of if else statements. Make our class declaration. And now inside our main method, let's go ahead and make a variable, um, an integer, we'll call it a, and we'll set it equal to, let's just say two to begin with. So now using if else statements, what we can say is if a equals one, and we need a double equal there. go ahead and print out a is 1 else now we would say 
a is 2. Now this is pretty straightforward. We've seen this. We get uh, our a is not equal to 1, so we go to our else statement. But what happens if we want multiple comparisons? Let's say this is going to be uh, 4 should do it. So our else statement, well, a isn't actually going to be 2. So what if we wanted to print out a different statement for each one of these cases? Well, we could do inside our else another if statement and say if a equals 2, a is 2. And now we can handle the case for 3, saying if a equals 3, Let's say a equals 4, and you'll see why I'm doing all of this craziness in a minute, but a is 4, and then of course if it's not 4, let's just say a is something else. Let's go ahead and get rid of this line here, and we'll print it out. So a is 4, and we're printing out this statement here, but you can see we have to go through all of this, and in terms of maintainability, this becomes a little bit complicated, because now you have to keep track of all of these different brackets, and I know Eclipse helps us a little bit, because if we go to the outside of it, we can see where it pairs up with pretty quickly. But again, this isn't, um, it's not very elegant. And we actually have a better way of handling this. So for this situation, let me just go down here. Um, what we could do is replace this again with our switch statements. So let me save this and go ahead and open up a new file. And I'll name this switch case dot Java. And we'll just say use of the switch case statements class declaration. And now, let's do the same thing. We'll have an integer a equals 4. Now, rather than nest all of these loops, and here's where I had said about um, scalability, if you need to make changes or add code later on. If we needed to add the case for if a was 5, now we have to go ahead and put an if and handle all of that. So it becomes a little bit tedious to figure out where we have to put it and then add all of that in. So that makes sense to use our switch scenario. And what we do is we type our switch. We're going to pass the variable that we want to handle in it. And now we want to handle each of the cases for the values that we might anticipate. So we might have our case for 0, and we'll execute a statement or series of statements. Now I'm going to do different things in each one of these just to show that we're not necessarily doing the exact same thing each time. In the case that we have 0, let's just print out the word 0, and now break out of it. In the case that we have a 1, Let's go ahead and do, let's make a new integer, we'll call it b, and set it equal to a plus 5, and now print it out. b 
is, and then we'll concatenate our variable b, and now of course our break statement. Let's have our case 2, and let's do an integer c this time, is going to be equal to a times 5, which should give us 10. And now let's do our print, and we'll say c is c. And now I'm going to leave out the break statement here, just to show you what happens if we do that. Now we'll have our case for 3. And let's just say in this situation we want to have an integer d equal to... Um, a plus 50, so it should be pretty obvious what we're doing, and we'll just do our print statement. Our case for 4. We got 4. And finally, let's do a default, and we'll just put um, nothing to see here, move along, and break out of it. So now if we went ahead and ran this, and just remember that a is equal to 4, so we anticipate getting this case here. We run it, and that's exactly what occurs. So now let's go ahead and just change this back and which one in case 2 I actually left out the break statement. So let's see what happens when we do that. So we evaluate and we don't have 0, we don't have 1, we have 2. We're going to store into some variable c a which is 2 times 5. So we get c is equal to 10. Now we print out 10. We get that down here. And now we actually get this 52 on the line. Well, that comes from here where we're saying D is equal to A, and the last we checked it was 2. So 50 plus 2 gives us D, and now we're printing that out. So because we left out the break statement, we just keep right on going with the instructions. So if we were to take that out as well, and let's run it again, we get the next one and let's go ahead and comment that line out and run it again and we actually get the default case as well so you might actually find situations where you want to leave out the break statement although I probably wouldn't advise it but it's a possibility that you could leave open but under normal circumstances just make sure you include it otherwise you may get some interesting results So let's move on, and that covers our um, if else and the switch. So now let's do our for loop, and we'll create a new class for that. Uh, what am I doing? New file, and we'll just call this for. Say use of for loop make our main method okay so let's go ahead and make a string array in this case so string we do these open and closing brackets and we'll just name this names and we'll say we want a new string array now we could put a number in here to say how many explicit values we want to store into this or we can just right away assign the names we want to put in here so let's just put a few names in here I'll use my name uh, let's go ahead and just say Alice Bob 
Adam, Eve, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five should do it. Let me just make a little comment. We have five names indexed zero through four. So with our for loop, what we can do is open up with our for. We want to start with our initialization of our indexing variable i. We're setting it equal to zero. Now we want to evaluate or continue this loop for i is less than, well, we have five values. And I'll just use this hard-coded at first, and I'll show you a little bit better way to handle this. So let's just go ahead and say the current index is i, and then on the next line, the current name is names and we have to tell it which name index we want to give. So we're going to use whatever our i is. And then this way, it's going to start with names at 0, and then increase by 1. So names at 1, and then name at 2, name at 3, name at 4. Now i is going to be 5. 5 is not less than 5, so we're good. If we had put 6 here, so we would increase, now 5 is less than 6, name at position 5. Well, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. There is nothing at 5, and we would throw an error. So let me just show you what happens with the error. Here we have an exception in thread, array index out of bounds exception. And it gives you the number explicitly of what position that occurred at. So we, again, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's saying it happened at 5 and there is no fifth value. There is no position five in our array. So that's why it can be a little confusing if you start using hard-coded values. So let's see it run properly. And that's fine. We get the name Brandon, Alice, Bob, Adam, and Eve. Now another way to handle this, if we had actually gone up here and added a name, let's just say Tom, well, now Tom doesn't get printed because we would have to now go ahead and change this value. So a way we can handle that is just to take our string variable called names. And we have this option here to return the length of that string array. So when we use that, now here it's going to return the length, and in this case our length is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have 6 values in there, so as long as our i is less than the length of it, i is less than 6, continue running through it. So it wants to save, and now of course Tom is included. And let's just add another name to it and save it and now we don't have to change anything else, it'll just include that. So as this changes, the length will always update itself automatically. Now another way that we can actually go through this, and I'll just cover the enhanced for loop. Let's go ahead and create a new file, and we'll name this enhanced for loop. Now to make this a little quicker, I'm just going to copy and paste the code from here. We just have to make some changes. Use of enhanced for loop. And our class is called enhanced for loop. So update that. And now we're going to have the same structure here. But rather than using this style of for loop, 
we're going to use that enhanced for loop that I said. So now our array that we're going through is of type string. So we want a single string value. So I'll just call this S. And we're going to pass into that from our names array. So basically this is for, and in PHP language, they refer to this as the for each statement. And it's the same thing. So what we're saying is for each value or each string in names array, assign it into S and do something with it. So let's go ahead and say, Now, if we wanted to do the current position, uh, I'm not really too sure we can actually do that because we're not, we don't have a way of keeping track of that. But we can print out the name. So we can say the name is, we concatenate whatever is in our S. So let's go ahead and run this. And now it goes through for each of these names, print out the name. So it's a much easier way um, of, I don't want to say much easier, but a, a simpler way of achieving the same results by using this enhanced for loop. Now a few other things we can do with the for loops uh, we can nest them inside each other. So let's go ahead and do for integer j equals 0. j is less than 10. j plus plus. So this is going to loop through 10 times. And the first time through, we want to print j. And now let's run another for loop inside of here. And we'll say integer k equals 0. k is less than 20. k plus plus. Now we're doing print statements, not print ln. Just keep mind. And is that um, if k equals 19, let's just print a blank line. So let's go ahead and run this. And now we can see what's happening. So we're going to print. Maybe it'll be easier if I bring this up. So this second part that we put in here is a nested series of for loops. And so we're going to run the first one. We print out our j, which is where we get the 0. And now we want to loop through. And each time we loop through, we're just going to print out an asterisk. This only gets executed at the very last time through this for loop. So we print 20 asterisks, and then finally on the last one, we also print onto a new line. Now this for loop finishes, and we go here. Now j is added to 1, so now we have 1. 1 is less than 10, so we're going to repeat this process again. And this loop runs. 10 times each time we run this one 20 times. So that's what plays out there. And you can keep nesting on into infinity, but you're going to start to have memory issues as you start to do this more and more often. And this sort of concept plays out later on when we start talking about recursion. 
when you might have a method call itself a few different times and each time it's going to be copying its value set onto the stack and this can actually cause Java to run out of memory and your program will actually crash or stop running because of it. So now let's jump into, well, we covered the if else, the switch, the for loop, the enhanced for loop. Uh, let's open up another class called the while loop. We have a new file, let's just call this while loop. Loops and now <clears throat> okay, so let's make our flag initialize to true. And let's go ahead and start our while loop and just put in flag. So as long as our flag is true, we're going to just say hello. And now if we actually run this, we're going to see that situation where it's an infinite loop. And you see it's just printing out hello, and we get Windows thinking. To break out of this in Eclipse, we can go ahead and hit this terminate button here and we're actually just stuck in this infinite loop here what we could do let's just show this integer x equals 0 and let's say x plus plus Let's also include the number so you can see how many times this is iterating through and you can quickly see this number increasing. Eventually this is going to crash. Now again, rather than wait for that to happen, what we can do is say print it out and if x is equal to, how far did we get here? All right, so let's set it to 55,555. I don't know, some arbitrary number. Now we want to say our flag equals false. So this is going to keep running. And when we have our x value is set to this, we now switch our flag to false and we break out of that loop. Now, alternately, we can have this start out at false. And if we run it, well, there's our program. We never actually ran our while loop because um, the condition was never meant for it to actually run. Let's just put some arbitrary thing and we can see we just immediately jump to this statement here now to contrast this with the do while loop let's go ahead and make another class and we'll just call this do while loop dot java use of do while Open up, make our main method. I'm going to go back and just copy the same code here. We're going to change it a little bit. So let's go above the while statement. We'll open up with a do. And now let's copy our code here. And 
and just edit it so it looks like this. Put a space to separate it a little bit. Now our flag in this case is false. So while our flag is true, this should loop through. But what we're going to see is that in this situation, it actually runs through one time. And it would continue running if we set this to true. But again, this differs from the regular while in that when we ran this, we just immediately jumped to here. In this case, we ran it at least one time. And then depending on how the while loop, uh, the while condition evaluates, it would continue or wouldn't. So now we're setting it to true and it's going to continue again until our flag is set to false and then we break out and print this here statement. So that covers the while, the do while, and then I guess finally we have to cover the ternary operator. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll create another class and we'll call this ternary. Okay, again, I'm going to make uh, a Boolean flag, set it to true, and now we'll say we want to store or initialize some variable z with an integer, but we're going to use the ternary operator. So we're going to use our flag as our evaluation. And let's just start out simple. We'll say 3 or 5, as we had in our example previously, and store that in there. So if we run this, uh, we're not going to see anything until we print it out. Z is... Let's go ahead and run it. Z is 3. And so we got here. We're going to initialize z with some value. Flag is true, so we're going to execute this and store that into our variable. If we change this to false, we get 5. And just to throw this in there, if we use the not symbol, it switches it back. So if the opposite of our flag. So our flag is false. We're going to switch it to true because of the negation. So now we're going to evaluate the true. 3 gets stored into z, and we print out 3. Now another way we could do this, and let's just use a different integer value. Let's say integer m is equal to our flag question mark. And in this situation, we're going to have two different methods that will return an integer value for this. So let's just call this method 1 and method 2. Sorry, I forgot the parentheses for our method calls. Now, these methods don't exist yet. So we can create these methods quickly by just hovering over it and creating it and Eclipse does this for us. Now this says it's going to return an object, but what we actually want it to return is an int. And let's just change it to returning uh, 3 and 5. So we'll print out m is so again we're taking an integer 
variable m and assigning it a value depending on whatever our method returns. Now, which method gets called depends on this flag. So if our flag is true, we would call method 1. And if our flag is false, we're going to call method 2. In this case, our flag is false, so we expect method 2 to run. And method 2 returns 3. So let's go ahead and run this. And we get m is equal to 3, which is exactly what we expected. So that uses pretty much all of these different things that we've talked about. Um, one other one I want to go over, I said I would touch upon the use of the keyword continue. So let's go back to our while loop class. And let's go ahead and just um, let's get rid of this statement to simplify things a little bit. And before we check that, let's go ahead and put an, another if statement. If our x, let's use the modulus operator. If we divide by 5 and we get no remainder, continue. And actually, in order to see what I want this to do, I'm going to cut this out and put it right above our print statement. So let me separate that, and I'll just put a little note here, and while loop. Well, let's go ahead and run this. And what happened? OK, our flag was false, so it didn't even run. So let me just change that back to true. And OK, so now we're going to run it as we had previously. And that's actually pretty funny. Let me break out of this. The reason this is an ending is because of that value there. OK, so if we just scroll up, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but if you notice, here, we jump from 99 to a 1, and we're skipping over 4, uh, 45,200. And again, we're skipping over 45,205 in here, and we're skipping over 45,210. So the pattern is that we're skipping over any number that is divisible by 5 directly. So any number that divided by 5 gives us no remainder, we're just going to run this continue statement. And if I take out the hello, and let me make this a smaller number so that we can really just see this. Uh, let me make it 501. So you can see we skip 5, we skip 10, we skip 15. We skip 20. What this is doing is, in the case that this is true, we're saying continue, which jumps us right down to the end of this while loop. And now we go back and we check our flag. Our flag is still true. So we continue doing this. And before, we had an infinite loop, because if I had left this at 500, 500 is divisible by 5 directly without a remainder. So we would be breaking out and never actually get to this statement. So we would never actually be setting our flag to false. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight the use of the continue statement. What it's doing is it's telling us to break out of this loop and jump down to uh, the end of it and then reevaluate it once again. So it's somewhat similar to the way that the break statement threw us down to the end of this switch statement. But when we're using it with loops, such as the while loop, 
it still may continue going, it, we can just use it to break out of our code for certain circumstances. Now, I believe that's all that I really needed to cover, and you can mess around with all of these in some detail. Um, actually, let me cover one other situation, which I came across kind of recently, where I had somebody ask, let me just make some space here. They had a whole series of different if-else statements. So they had um, if um, value one, I'm sorry, let me do integer value one, value two, and value three. And they were doing if value one equals zero and value, I shouldn't have had a space there, value two equaled zero. Value three equals was assigned to zero. And it's giving us an error because these haven't been assigned yet. So let's just go ahead and say value one equals zero and value two uh, is assigned zero rather. And they had a whole series of statements like this printed out where they were checking for this. And in each and every one of these cases, they were assigning zero based on the pattern that the first value was zero. So in any case where the first value is zero, the third one was also zero. Then they also had this situation pop up where they were saying if this one was one, but this one was zero, then again we had zero. And this continued. six there so that covers that and then they had value one and this one one and this one two and this one three and this one four and we'll just keep it somewhat the same I know this is kind of long and tedious but in this situation what they were saying was um, we got zero And when they were equal, I believe, then we move to 1. Uh, this will be the last one that I'll do just to show exactly what was going on. In this case, we had 2, 0, 2, 1. Two, two. Zero and Two, 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 two. 
So what was happening was value, in the case where value one was zero, value three was zero. In the case where value one was or value two was zero rather, we also had zero. But in the case where value two was equal to or greater than value one, we were storing whatever was in value one. So ultimately, rather than writing these rules, we could simplify all of this into a single line of code. And let me just write the rules in longhand. First, we could simplify this a little bit by saying if value two is less than or equal to value one, value two is equal to value three. I'm sorry, value three, I wrote that backwards, is equal to value two. Else, in all other cases, our value three was actually just set to value one. So again, let's check this with value two being less than or equal to value one. So this is value two, it's less than or equal to value one. We're gonna assign value two into three. And in the case where they're equal, we still assign value two. And in the case where value three, uh, value two is greater than value one, we're just going to assign value one into value three. So this is the somewhat abridged version of writing all of those rules out longhand, but we can actually achieve all of this in a single line by using well, we already declared, so value three is going to be assigned using value two less than or equal to value one And now we've taken all of these rules condensed them in this situation into four lines of code and in this situation we've actually gone even further and improved it using our ternary operator into a single line of code so again let me just count this we've taken One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, twenty-eight, forty-two 12, 13, 14, 28, lines of code and condensed it into a single line right here. So again, if we had some problem and we took out all of this code, if we had some problem, we only need to look at a single line to figure out what's going on. And there's less chance that you're going to make an error in this single line than you would in all of these 42 lines of code that we wrote here. Here you might make a mistake uh, where you accidentally put the wrong number or whatever. So like I said before, this makes your code much more maintainable and easier to debug when you can condense it down. Uh, it pretty much does it for all of our different um, flow control 
options. And we've taken some cases where we've condensed code, especially here, and we've shown the difference between, let's say, the while loop and the do while loop. So it becomes up to you to figure out which one you want to apply to your code. And there's really no right or wrong answer. You can pretty much mix and match these. It depends, number one, what you feel most comfortable with, and number two, which tool is right for the job. You may find that you use one, and later on, it doesn't fit exactly as you want, so you go ahead and change it. And as you get more experience with it, you'll figure out which ones to use in different scenarios. So that concludes the duration of this tutorial, and we'll pick up in the next tutorial using a few different objects. Uh, I think I'm going to go over the string objects and the different methods that we can use with that. So check out the next tutorial.